Hello, my name is Sarah and I am your chakra coach. On this podcast, we'll be exploring how the chakra system can help guide you to grow your emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual wellness, leading you closer to your highest self. This episode of Your Chakra Coach is brought to you by Blissoma Skincare. Blissoma Skincare has already won 15 awards since its inception. Their products contain 75% or more active ingredients, far more than synthetic skincare options that usually only contain 1 to 15% actives. Blissoma products are made in-house in their herbal studio in St. Louis in small batches to control potency and freshness and to keep their ingredients lists trustworthy. And through the end of 2022, Blissoma is offering you 30% off trial skincare sets. Each set contains a curated range of deluxe trial size products so that you can test out a complete routine of five products at an affordable price. The set should last about two weeks with daily use. There's a link in the show notes and use coupon code chakra coach, all one word, to be sure you get your 30% discount. Hello, fellow explorers. What's going on? I hope you enjoyed the interview with Anna Dea last week. I'm still revisiting the things we talked about, especially the discussion of the full expression of female archetypes. Just remembering that we have so many possibilities within us at all times and that the expectation of us from ourselves, our families, workplace, community, society, religion, wherever the expectation comes from, the expectations can be such a big part of what limits us from knowing ourselves completely and tapping into the power of these archetypes to experience the full range of humanity. Instead of pushing those parts of us away, we can spend time exploring them and even cultivating them so that they're developed when we need them. Learning to love the parts of ourselves that we think of as difficult or too much. So much of the time, I think that critical voice in our heads is trying to get us to stop expressing the parts of ourselves that aren't easy or that are at odds with what society says we should be, like confidence in our worth. I I can't believe how many subtle and not so subtle signals there are for us to undermine our own value. I was just having this conversation earlier this week. In the same breath, in the same post, the same article, we'll be told that we're great exactly the way we are. If only we'd change something. And I feel like it's always something physical that we have to change or a behavior that we need to adopt or stop. Anyway, like I said, I've been thinking about what the archetypes and their expression mean in my life on a day-to-day basis. If you haven't had a chance to listen to the interview, go back and listen. Even if you take it in chunks to get through it all, it's it's definitely worth your time. Today, we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system stress response. You might have heard this called fight or flight, which is certainly easier to say. You might even have heard the addition of the freeze response. And there's a fourth, which I don't think we talk about much, but is so common in the people I talk to. And that's the fawn response. Over the next few weeks, we're going to go over all of these stress responses, why they happen, why they're great and why they're not so great, as well as which chakras might be imbalanced by them if we're in a constant state of stress arousal. And I'll give you some techniques to help soothe the stress response and rebalance the chakra. For our purposes today, we'll think of the nervous system in two parts sympathetic and parasympathetic. Both are part of the autonomic nervous system, which has a a third division, but that's getting into more information than we really need today. So just remember the sympathetic and parasympathetic for now. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for activating acute stress response or your reaction to a specific perceived danger. And I say perceived because the danger doesn't have to be real or immediate to get a response from your body. And it doesn't have to be a physical danger, although it's believed that the response developed to help humans react quickly to physical threats. In the world we live in, there's emotional danger and mental danger too, or at least that's how our bodies see the situation. Physical danger could be a 
wild animal getting ready to attack us or a car coming at us fast as we're crossing the street. Emotional or mental danger could be when our partner or boss says, we need to talk. Either way, our sympathetic nervous system fires up and gets us ready to do something. It sends out a distress signal to the body, causing it to release hormones, which cause a physical response. Heartbeat speeds up, pushing more blood and oxygen to the muscles and other vital organs. During a freeze response, the heart rate might slow. Pulse and blood pressure can increase. Breathing speeds up to get more oxygen into the blood. During a freeze response, breathing may be interrupted or restricted. Small airways in the lungs open wide. Increased oxygen to the brain leads to increased alertness and sharpened senses. Pupils might dilate to let in additional light and your hearing improves. More blood sugar and fats are released into the bloodstream to supply extra energy. Ongoing perception of a threat leads to further release of adrenaline and cortisol. Skin may get cold or sweat, as can your hands and your feet. Pain perception might reduce. It's very uncomfortable to be in this state. But the point is to give us the tools we need to get rid of the danger, end it, hide from it, evade it altogether. When the danger ends, then our parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and starts reducing those awful feeling sensations and gets us back to normal. At least that's the idea. It doesn't always work that way in our current world. If your job is triggering the sensation of danger every minute of every day, your sympathetic nervous system will always be on. You'll always be experiencing those miserable sensations, even though you're not in physical danger. And so many things trigger that feeling of danger. Relationships, traffic, responsibilities, excessive stimulation, noise, exhaustion, deadlines, social media, and dozens of other pieces of daily life. Depending on how sensitive your nervous system is, you could stay elevated for hours from one discrete event, right? Something that was almost over before it began. And our parasympathetic nervous systems are so dysregulated that they're unable to bring us back to a calmer state before the next thing sets us off. If this sounds like you, you're not alone. It might feel like it because people who aren't like that don't always understand. They'll call you overly sensitive and make it seem like you're, you're crazy. You're not. You're not. You're well within the spectrum of normal, and being highly sensitive isn't a bad thing anyway. Our ancestors needed people like that for the species to survive. The problem is that now there's constant stimulation for most of us, constant perceived danger, and we get overwhelmed without ever getting a chance to regulate. We forget what it's like to even feel calm. And for people that had traumatic childhoods, that hyper-stimulated state always being on alert feels normal. When given the opportunity to let down their guard, it can feel very uncomfortable. I see time and time again people in this situation recreating drama and trauma in their adult lives because having their sympathetic nervous system constantly in overdrive feels right, but it's damaging their bodies and their minds, and it's hurting them in all sorts of ways. Anyway, that might have been a bit of a side road, but I think it's important to talk about it. I always knew I was highly sensitive to noise and commotion, but I never had the language to talk about it or understand it. So when I was given the language, gifted the language, it made so much sense And I was able to stop seeing myself as weird or an anomaly and start understanding that it was just how my body and brain function. More importantly, I was able to take some steps to regulate it, which I still do every day. So once that sympathetic response is activated, we have a few different options. Like I said earlier, which one we choose can be based on the specific threat cultural programming, past experiences, genetic knowledge, and more, or a combination of of any of those or all of those. Our choices are fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Some people might say fawn is only used when the other three fail, but I think more and more, some of us default to fawn as we experience the world around us or, or if we're pressured by our social programming. And 
when I say the response we choose, we don't choose it con- consciously. We choose it as a result of our histories or as a result of the specific stimuli. So you're not necessarily picking one. Today, I'll fight. Today, I'll flight. The first response is fight, which feels obvious. We know what fighting looks like, don't we? If there's a, a lion attacking us and we choose to fight, that's physical combat, fighting. But what about something less obvious? A fight response could look like harsh words, a snarky comeback, a sarcastic comment, words designed to provoke. This is a fight response. However, it doesn't use the physical preparations that the stress response is preparing our bodies for. The extra hormones that get our muscles ready never get dissipated and they just hang out in the blood and in the muscles making us anxious and antsy which is part of why two people in fight mode keep escalating in an effort to get rid of them. It's not a great or particularly effective way to handle our hormones, but we're societally conditioned not to hit, which is really good and really important. But the fight response is primarily a physical one, and we we don't use our muscles to complete the sympathetic nervous system cycle when we respond verbally, which just means that The stress hormones stay present for longer, making us more likely to engage in the fight response more often and feel stressed out all day, every day. The chakra most responsible for the fight reflex is the solar plexus chakra, the energy center of action and heat and anger. I know we often think of anger as an emotion and the sacral chakra as the seat of emotions, but in this case, And in a lot of cases, actually, anger is a secondary emotion that suppresses a primary emotion, fear, humiliation, whatever. So anger is a solar plexus chakra response and something that we have to kind of build up to to get in fight mode for a physical stress response. And since this chakra also governs action, a fight is the perfect storm here. If this is a common stress response for you, and it is for a lot of people, especially when you remember that the fight response isn't limited to just a physical fight, then you might have an overactive solar plexus chakra. Or maybe it isn't overactive all the time, but when you sense emotional danger, the solar plexus takes over in an effort to protect yourself. Let's talk about that for a second here. Emotional danger. Emotional danger is when we sense that we're going to be forced into an uncomfortable or unwanted emotional state to experience emotions that we would just rather not deal with. Sadness, loneliness, rejection, disrespect, jealousy, even boredom can be scary. So if we sense that we're going to feel them or we start to feel them, It might be our inclination to cover them with anger, which stimulates the fight response rather than a different response. Or worst case, you know, what if we actually had to feel and process our emotions, you know? I hope it doesn't sound like I'm just going on and on about this, but so much of what causes these responses in us these days is emotional or mental danger, not physical danger. And looking underneath our anger just doesn't occur to us a lot of times. Anger feels righteous or justified, but I can't think of a modern problem that has ever been fixed or resolved by lashing out in anger. Yet we do because our solar plexus chakras are so overactive. It's no surprise maybe that the adrenal glands, the stress hormone cortisol, sits squarely in the purview of the solar plexus chakra. These Glands are so overworked in most of us, just pumping out stress hormones all day as we try not only to manage our own lives, but we also get bombarded with stressful situations nationwide and globally. I talked a little bit about this in episode 89. So if you want more about that, go listen to that one. But the important thing to note is that we can be in a a constant state of preparing for action and so. Many of us want to fight about it. We fight with our families, our neighbors. We fight on social media. We want to fight because somehow 
We're trying to process these hormones out of our bodies, but the methods we choose don't work. And even if they did, there's new stress hormones to replace them almost right away. So what can we do? As with most things, the best first step is recognizing what's going on. Bring some awareness to your body, to your reactions, to your thoughts, to your emotions. Notice and name these feelings, these experiences. But that might feel like a lot of sitting around thinking in the moment. There's the old advice to take 10 deep breaths before you do anything, and that is great advice if you can do it. I use this one before responding to emails or texts that get my blood boiling. Breath helps slow down the increased heart rate and can lower your blood pressure. Uh, can reverse some of those physical responses to stress stimuli. From a chakra perspective, the diaphragm, the muscle involved in deep belly breathing, sits right near your solar plexus chakra. Remember that the chakras are where the veil between the physical body and the energy body is very thin and permeable. So moving the diaphragm moves the space where that energy is building up in your solar plexus chakra. Your breath is literally moving it out and away from the anger response chakra. That's why a regular deep breathing practice physically and energetically helps relieve anxiety. Another thing you can do, which I love, is movement. Probably any type of movement will do. Have you heard, have you heard the term rage walk? It's, it's feeling really angry and going for a really aggressive walk to push that energy away from your body. And the blood flow moves your stress hormones back into the organs where it can be processed and your body can come down from its high alert state. Other high intensity movements would do the same, uh, but they're not always practical or even possible for everybody. One of my favorites is stretching. I mean, not a, a rigorous stretch or a full yoga class or anything, though that would be fine. But just reaching your arms overhead, taking some side bends, twisting your spine gently. It's the same concept as the movement of breathing, right? We, we want to get that energy buildup dissipated. But what about times when you, you can't just leave a situation to go for a walk or stretching would be weird? Try this. Intentionally tighten all your muscles. Hold for a second and then release them. If you're trying to keep your cool in a meeting or an office setting, just squeeze your legs and hips and abs. It's subtle, it's subtle, fast, just do it a couple of times and you'll be amazed how dampened your fight response is. You'll be able to come at the situation with a much cooler head. Plus, your body will feel better, less anxious, less of that general misery that accompanies a release of stress hormones that aren't dealt with. Again, because we're working with the solar plexus chakra here, it's action. It's releasing the pressure in that part of your body. Combine these in-the-moment techniques with regular solar plexus chakra care, and you can reduce the fight response in yourself, or at the very least, have a little more control over when you use it, rather than it being sort of a, a, a knee-jerk reaction to whatever's happening. Chakra work lets us design our inner world and therefore how we go through our outer world. And most of us don't find that fighting physically or with words helps our problems go away. It makes them a lot worse a lot of the time. But at least if we know it's a natural response with a long evolutionary history, we can stop adding to our discomfort by beating ourselves up over it. Sometimes just knowing what's happening can make an enormous difference. When you have time, after the immediate danger has passed, you can do some reflection to see what sparked the fight instinct in you. And life will be a lot better and easier if we're not also trying to repair the damage we've done to ourselves and our relationships by responding with aggression. And by seeing and addressing any root cause of the solar plexus response, we'll be feeling and processing our emotions in a healthy way that can reduce the chronic stress we're all under. Okay, I know it was a long one today. <laughs> a long time to listen to me talk, but I'm, I'm so very, very grateful that you're here and that 
you're healing, that we're healing together because you, you got to know I'm not immune to any of this stuff. Over the next few weeks, we'll cover the other stress responses, flight, freeze, and fawn. So if you didn't hear yourself in this episode, don't worry. I got you. You're coming up. As a reminder, my seven-day chakra manifesting course is on my website, yourchakracoach.com, if you're interested in that. And I'm on Facebook and Instagram for uh, personal messages, direct messages, and any questions. If this show is improving your life and helping you out, I'd love it if you'd go over to the Patreon page and support me there. You can find bonus videos, meditations, yoga poses for the chakras, and some other things. And it really, really does help me keep bringing this show to you every week. I hope you have a phenomenal day, and I so look forward to talking again next week. Bye.